where two or more gather is holy ground. Where Jesus is in the midst. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a holy place and there was the holiest place. But now the holy place is right here in the lives of believers. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit if you're one of His. If you're not one of His, that doesn't count. But you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I had I read something uh, on the internet. I get, I get a, uh, an email every once in a while from the Berean Call. I don't know how many are familiar with the Berean Call. Dave Hunt and uh, a fellow named McMahon. Great apologetics ministry had been for years and years. I got an email, and they, and they asked this question. They said, the gospel test, the gospel test, do your people really know the good news? Now, this is addressed to pastors, okay? So it's addressed to me. Do your people really know the good news? And, and they asked this question, if, if we were to leave church this morning and walk out the door and walk down the steps, and out there was uh, like Rick Earl from Channel 11, or pick your whatever, maybe you watch Channel 4, whatever. And they had, the, they had the news truck there with a satellite thing, and he was out there with a microphone. And he came up to you and he said, excuse me, could you tell me how I can be saved? And he put the microphone in your face. Amen. Now, ask yourself this question. You don't have to answer it to me. Okay, well, you do, I guess. But do you really know? Now, I've said this before. I've grow, I grew up in a church where they didn't teach me anything about how to be saved. They taught me how to be a good, whatever the church was. But they didn't teach me how to get to heaven. At least, not the Bible way, anyway. And, and there's a lot of folks, there's a lot of churches, there's a lot of folks who kind of sit up in church, and they, and either, either they're not being told or they're not listening. I hope, it's the latter case here, that if, you know, you're being told, but if you don't know, it's because you're not listening. But uh, what, would, what would your answer be if, if they put the microphone in front of you and say, how do you get saved? Or, have you ever seen uh, the Living Waters, uh, Way of the Master, Roy Comfort and the uh, Kirk Cameron? Have you seen they go out on the street with a camera with a microphone and they ask people, you know, are you saved? And, and it's a good question. Uh, I know what I would say, and I, I better know what I would say, because I get paid <laughs> to do this. So I better know what I'm talking about. How about you? Do, do you know if somebody would ask you that question? And it's important because ultimately we're not here for the church of God. We're not here for the, the place. The place is here for you, and you're here to learn so you could... Go out there. Because we're here not to support the building. We're here to do what Jesus did. Jesus came to save sinners. And he gave us the authority to go forth and to preach and speak his word to a lost and dying world. We're supposed to be lights in the middle of darkness. I was watching, you know, uh, coming up here in a little over a week, Rose and I and Miss Lou, we're going to get on an airplane and fly to Germany. We've got blessed we'll be able to go to Germany for a couple weeks. And uh, I don't know if you, if you heard this story on the news in the last week or so, <laughs> but there was, a, there was a pilot who was flying an airplane. And I guess, I don't know if he dozed off or what, but he woke up and he saw the planet Venus. Did you, did you, read, that? Did you read that in the paper? And when he saw the planet Venus, it kind of freaked him out. He thought it was another plane coming, so he dove. I'm hearing stories like this and thinking, I, don't, I wonder how long it takes to get there by a boat. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to take a cruise to Germany. But <laughs> when we look up in the sky <laughs> and we see, we see the stars, you know, for centuries those stars have told a story. Some people believe that before the flood, that they actually, the, the, the ancients used the stars to tell the story of God's redemptive plan for mankind. And the world took it and perverted it into what we call the, the horoscope now. It's astrology. It's, it's evil now. 
But before they had the, the, the Word and before they had the Bible, they were able to look at the different constellations and tell the story of God's plan about the seed who, the, the woman's seed who would bruise the serpent's head and so forth. And we look up there and we see the lights in the sky when it's not too cloudy. Do you know that we are supposed to be lights in a dark generation? How many people know the generation we live in right now is a dark, it's darkness. The world is full of darkness, not just in the United States of America, but all over the world. It's covered with darkness. And while we're still here as believers, we're supposed to be light. I'm not sure that all of us grasp that. It's sad to say there are a lot of people who are in ministry that don't grasp that or maybe have lost that concept. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the Philippians. Philippians. And we're going to read chapter 2. Or at least start there. Right. Philippians chapter 2. And we want to start with verse 5. And this is one of those passages of Scripture that if you want to be a, if you want to understand Scripture and understand what the Word says, this is one of those very, very important passages that you ought to at least, maybe not memorize it, but at least understand where it is and what it says. Because it tells us about Jesus and what He did and who He was. You know, that's the most important question anybody can ask. People say, how can you determine the difference between a Christian church and a cult or what is true and what is false? It all depends on what they say about Jesus. So you can have good works, you can have a moral upbringing, you can have things like that. But if you get Jesus wrong, you're still going to end up in hell. You're still going to end up apart from God. So it's important that you understand. I'm, I'm thankful and I really appreciate, Carol, thank you for talking about, you know, our purpose, one of the things is to build the body of Christ by the understanding of God's Word. That's what we've always, it's always been our heart. So I hope you, you grab hold of this passage, and it's really just an introduction to what, where I really want to go. But it says this in verse 5, this is written to the church, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is how Jesus thought. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If you have a more modern translation, it'll say something like he thought equality with, with God was nothing to be grasped. And what it's saying is that while Jesus was very God from all eternity, he was willing to relinquish his hold on, on the, uh, the prerogatives of God. Okay, listen to what he says. It, it'll explain that as we go on a little further. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Very important that we understand that Jesus was God in the flesh. He wasn't a man that got some kind of godhood placed on him. He wasn't some kind of spirit that came down and jumped inside a body. He was completely God and completely man. He was God manifest in the flesh. He was born in a manger. He was born of a virgin. He was uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes just like this wonderful little baby right over here. He had to be changed and, 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 and nurtured and, and fed and everything like that. He started out just like you or I did. But... Even as he was that little baby in the manger, he was God. When he was being formed in his mother's womb, he was God. He was willing, it says, that he made himself of no reputation. And, and, and again, a more modern translation might say he emptied himself from one form to another. He emptied himself into a body like this. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became a man like us. He grew up like us. He was born like us. And when the time came for him to be the sacrifice, he suffered. He wasn't just like some spirit hanging. Some folks think, well, he didn't really suffer. He didn't really feel pain. Listen, if somebody pounded a nail into your hand, you would feel Pain. He felt that pain. If somebody ripped your beard out, for the men, women don't help, but if somebody ripped your, you would feel pain. If somebody hit you, you would feel, he felt the pain because why? He was completely man and completely God. It's so important that we grasp that. Because them folks coming knocking on your door, they'll tell you he was something else. They'll tell you he was an angel. They'll tell you he was... Uh, the brother of Lucifer. They'll tell you whatever. They'll make up all kinds of stories about Jesus. If you don't get that right, you're not going to get nothing else right. 
He was completely God. And he was completely man. And he humbled himself. He didn't have to do it, but he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So as a man, he could have commanded legions of angels to come and defend him when they came to take him in the garden. He could have, he could have commanded the stars to move. He could have done anything. Here's, here's a God that made the sun stand still. Yet he chose to allow himself to be taken, beaten, and nailed to a cross. Mocked and ridiculed, yet he spoke not a word. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, because he was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You've got to know that. So you, you need to, when, when, when you go out there, if Rick Earl's going to stand out there and ask you a question, you need to know what to tell him. This Jesus Christ that I follow, he was God in the flesh. Nothing less. Now, having said all that, he says this. Wherefore, the fact that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God has, what? Highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Why? Because he became the sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price. He, paid, he took my punishment that I might receive his blessing. Any hope that I have of blessing from God, I only have through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And nothing that I've done. Verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, at the name, listen, there's going to come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Every Hitler, every uh, Stalin, every beast that ever lived, every antichrist that ever lived will one day bow their knee in front of the great white throne and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. <laughs> See, that's why... I don't want to be in that bunch. I want to do it here. I want to do it on this side of the green, is what, how they say it. I want to do it on this side of the grave. I want to bow my knee now and own him as my Lord now. Because if you wait till after you die, then you'll, you're going to do it. But then the next thing you're going to hear is, Depart from me, you, you that work iniquity. I'd rather hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Okay, now. He says this. He says, Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That pretty much covers just about everybody. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now listen, that's the foundation of our faith. It has to begin there. It has to begin with faith in the God-man who came down here and gave his life that we might have eternal life. He died that we might live. He paid the price that we could be set free. His name is above every name. His name is above addictions, above sickness, above all these things. Jesus Christ is a name above all. See, everybody wants to, we're all looking for, we're all looking for a fix. There's some stuff in our lives that need fixed. How about you? I've got a few things that need fixed. Some things are a little more obvious than others. Just this morning, I was talking with, me and Pastor Todd were talking downstairs. And we were talking about getting control of this. Oh, no, nobody else has that problem. <laughs> Somebody said to me recently, don't get fat and don't get old. And I said, I'm trying, but it's not working. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't do anything about getting old but getting fat. I can do something about that. See, we don't think about things like that. We think about... Smoking crack and gambling and those things, you know. But see, I need, you know what, I need delivered from putting too much food in my mouth. And you know what, Jesus is a name above that. I need to learn how to call upon the name of Jesus Christ. I need to learn how to put my faith in His blood, His blood, to be able to give me what I need to be able to do what He wants me to do. But He don't want me to die early. Okay, now. It's a name above every name. That's the foundation. Faith in Christ. God who came to this earth and became man and died on the cross. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was risen again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. If Rick Earl stands out there and wants to ask you that question, you tell him that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's the answer. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Okay? Now, he says in verse 12, Now that we have established... That our salvation and our life in Christ is established 
through faith in him, he says this. Wherefore, in verse 12, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, the apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, somebody who'd been here the last couple of weeks would say, you know, last couple of weeks he'd been telling us we don't have anything to fear. Now he's telling us we've got to be afraid. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Not the same thing. God says, don't be afraid of that monster outside your door. Don't be afraid of that giant in, the, in your promised land that you don't think you can conquer. Don't be afraid of the, the world, the flesh, or the devil. I beat them. But when he's talking about fear here, he's talking about He's not talking about cowering, hiding in a corner, fear, being afraid. But he's talking about awe and respect. Listen, this responsibility that we've been given as believers, it's a heavy responsibility. This Christian thing, it's, it's, it's nothing to play with. It's like being married. Being married takes a lot of work. You can't, just can't take it for granted. The supper's going to be on the table every day. <laughs> now, the one that's laughing the loudest know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You've got to work at this marriage thing. <laughs> and I could say you've got to work at it with fear and trembling, but I won't do that either. But you've got to, anything, anything worth having, anything good worth having, is, you have to work for. Come on, is that, anybody say amen to that? Anything worth having, you've got to work for it. And when you, when you work for it and you get it, it's that much more enjoyable, that much more appreciated because you work for it. Okay, we're not talking about being afraid and hiding in the corner, but we're talking about understanding that when, when Jesus Christ came down and died for us and we received his love and he saved us, he gave us a commission, not just to the person standing behind the pulpit, but to everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he gave us a commission to take the word of God out into the world and to reproduce. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work out somebody else's salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own. Now look, verse 13. For it is God which works in you. When you get saved, the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior, God began a work in you. Some of us, we go along with a program. And God changes us and works on us and deals, and we allow God to, to conform us into the image of His Son. Some of us get a little more stubborn. And the more stubborn we get, the more God got to work with us. The, the, more, the more we turn our head and say, oh, I don't think so, God, the more He got to put on whatever He got to put on us to get us to the place where He wants us to be. How many know what I'm talking about? How many have had God had to push you into a place where he wants you to be. In the Old Testament, it talks about backsliders like being like a, a, a cow that you got to drag along like this. Some of us, man, we just go along. Yeah, I'm going along with the Lord. And some of us, he got to drag. But I'll guarantee this. If you put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're born again, then God will begin a work in you. And he said over there in uh, Philippians, I think he says that he's not going to stop until he finishes it. So you might as well go along with the program now. Now listen to what he says. It's God which works in you both to will and to do of what? His good pleasure. He doesn't work in us to promote us. He doesn't work in us so that we'll get accolades and people will see what a wonderful ministry we have. He works in us for his pleasure. And whether you minister to one person that's your next door neighbor or to thousands, it's for his pleasure. Less of me and more of him. That's what we sang in that song. He says, Verse 14. Now, maybe we should stop at 13. Do all things. Do all th this is to the church. This is to save people. This isn't to be saved or to get saved. This is to people who are saved. Do all things without work. Without what? Murmurings or disputings. You know what? I'll just tell you this. I can deal with a lot of things. And I, I, now... <laughs> And some of you might agree with me. I can, I can deal with a lot of things. But somebody that's constantly complaining to me. I mean, sometimes the people have a valid, they come up to you and they give you a valid complaint. They say such and such. And you say, okay. And you deal with that. I mean, that, you know, you can't, if there's something that needs dealt with, you know, and you don't know about it. I'll tell folks, if there's something, come and see me. If there's a problem, come and see me. But there's some folks that every time you see them come and you know,
complaints, <laughs> without murmurings and disputings. I told somebody one time, I said, there's one thing I hate is controversy. <laughs> I just, confrontation, I just, <laughs> you know. But it's part of life, right? I mean, it's, let's face it. Okay, now Paul says, listen, do all things without murmurings or disputings. There's, now, I'm getting to an end here. I, I want you to understand. There's a reason. That you may be, now here's what he says. That you as believers may be what? Blameless and harmless. That means that when you go out into the world, and you go into your workplace, and you go into your neighborhood, and you go into your families, and you want to tell them about Jesus, and you have this commission. Jesus said, go into all the world and, and teach them the things I've taught you and make disciples. As, as, as you do this, and if you do it without murmuring and complaining all the time, God wants us to be able to go to people and tell them about Jesus and not be able to have them point at us and say, yeah, but you, we have a responsibility to present ourselves to a lost and dying world in a way that's glorifying to God. He says, you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, and you can put daughters in there too, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Now, I want to tell you something. We live in a crooked and perverse nation. We live in a crooked and perverse generation. And it's getting worse and worse. It's like, what happened in the last 40 years? My generation was largely responsible. You know, my, you know the love generation. If it feels good, do it. That was my generation. You know, it's your thing, do what you want to do. Come on, some, some, many, many of you are in my generation. <laughs> Whatever feels good, do it. So now what do we have? We have a whole nation of people that are just doing whatever they feel like doing. They're not caring about anything else. It's a wicked and perverse generation. If it were not for the love of God and the blood of Jesus, I'd be right in the middle of it. Because I didn't care what anybody thought. I just want to do what felt good. Just want to have a good time. It's party. Right? He says, listen. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you what? Shine as lights in the world. God wants us to be lights in the middle of darkness. Believers. With the foundation of what we read there back there in, in the first part of Philippians, of what Jesus did for us, this isn't, you know, if you're not a believer, don't worry, it's, it, it doesn't apply to you. But if you own Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if He owns you, then He wants us to be lights in darkness. We have a responsibility. We have a command. We have a, a mandate to show the love of God. Be perfect. Listen, I'm not perfect, and neither are you. We have our faults. We have our quirks. We have our idiosyncrasies. Huh? You got to work at them. <laughs> We're work at living with one another with that. But these people, the, the, the darkness, they need to hear the truth of the gospel presented in love. Reading on a little bit more, we're going to look at one or two more. Uh, verse 16. Let's read verse 15 again. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. See, that light, whatever light that we, that we bear is going to be proportionate to how much we're holding forth God's word. They don't need our opinions. They don't need our politics. They don't need our, our business. They need the Word of God. We needed the Word of God. And people come and tell me their opinions. I really couldn't care. But when people start hitting me with the Word of God before I was saved, that's what I would run from. I'd argue with anybody about politics. I'd argue with anybody about anything. But when they started getting me with the Word of God, I knew I didn't have any argument against that. So I just said, no thanks. I went the other way. Thank God for His mercy. But holding forth the word of life. This is why we, we're so adamant. And I'm so adamant when somebody comes up here and stands behind here, I want them to preach out of God's word. Amen. I don't need to hear any stories or fairy tales. I want to hear what God's, what, what God's word has to say. Amen. He says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See, Paul was telling the Philippians, you know what? 
what I equipped you guys with, what I gave you, I gave you for the purpose, and everything you do is, laid to, is pretty much laid to my account. He says, verse 17, And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. What Paul is saying, and many of us might know this, when he wrote this letter to the church of Philippi, he was in prison. Actually, he was on house arrest. Okay, back then they didn't have the ankle braces. He had chained them to a Roman soldier. Okay, and he was on house arrest. And he was waiting uh, in an audience with Nero. Now, I don't know about you, but the last, if I live in that day, the last person I would want to stand in front of was Nero. Because if he was having a bad day, you'd end up with your head chopped off. He was crazy. I mean, you know, some folks, I go down to Westmoreland County, they say about some of, the guys, some of the judges down Westmoreland County. I don't know about them. But I know Nero, man. You don't want to get him on a bad day. So here's Paul, and he's waiting for an audience with Nero. And as far as he knew, the next day he could have his head chopped off. He didn't care. He says somewhere else, to live as Christ, to die as gain. But he said, if I be offered upon the sacrifice, I'll rejoice. For the same cause also you do rejoice in me. So what Paul is telling the Philippians here is this. Listen, everything I, I left you, the word I gave you, it was all for the purpose of giving you the word of life and the word of truth. That you could take light and be lights in the middle of darkness. That's what he wants for us. It says elsewhere in the word. Darkness hates light. I was just talking to a, uh, Sister Lynn and I were talking a little bit earlier about um, a gentleman that she, was, she had met, a pastor, who was a, a part of a church, a part of a denomination that was getting like really liberal. So the pastor wanted to leave the church because they were getting, they were getting away from the word of God. And he wanted to take his congregation with him. And his congregation didn't want to go. <laughs> so he was kind of left alone. I'm thinking, that guy ought to be jumping for joy. Because for righteousness sake, for righteousness, he, he, I mean, it's hard to you know, be rejected and have your whole congregation say, get out. But if it was for righteousness sake, Jesus said he ought to be doing a dance. If you're, if you're, if you're rejected for the sake of righteousness, look at just another passage or two, maybe. Over in the book of Ephesians, just a few things. And then and we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at, look at chapter 5. Now we've got to start with verse 1. Okay. This, is, this is how we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Reading passages like this, they're all through the New Testament. Admonitions to believers on how they ought to live. See, some folks get this idea, well, you know, I'm saved by grace, it doesn't matter how I live. Well, that's not, if that's the way you think, you ought to make sure you're saved. Because if you're saved by grace and Christ is living inside of you, there's, there's a way he wants us to live. See, it comes after salvation. Some people get to put the cart before the horse. They think, well, I've got to start living right for Christ to save me. You can never live right enough, right enough to deserve salvation. Salvation is a gift. But after we're saved, he wants to conform us to the image of his son. Listen to what Paul says in chapter 5 of Ephesians. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and what? Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Well, that's a, that's a lot of love. He's given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. That means that we ought to be willing to give ourselves as an offering for that lost and dying world. Now, if they nailed me to the cross, it wouldn't be good for anything. Because my blood can't save anybody. But the fact that I take the word of God and take it out, that's the offering he expects from us. Listen, look at verse 3. Oh, it's going to get a little, get a little nasty here now. Okay. People are going to start looking at their watches. It's time to go, time for lunch. <laughs> but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becomes... I'm not gonna, look at verse 4 <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to he, you know, he, he goes on neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks read this and look at what's passing for church nowadays 
No, there's great churches. Please don't misunderstand. There's good pastors preaching the word. I know some great pastors in town that are preaching God's word and, and, and standing firm. But I'm talking about the ones on TV with like 20,000 people in them. Look at what's passing for God's word. Yeah, <laughs> send it to me for <laughs> No, but you, you know, look at what's passing for God's word. I won't go into detail. Okay, look at verse 6. Verse, four, uh, verse 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See, that covers, that covers you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That covetousness, I, I confess that. There have been times in my life where I've, I have been covetous. I want a bigger house, nicer car. How come so-and-so can have a nice car and I can't have it? Oh, don't tell me you've never been there. Come on. I confess it and repent. I repent and confess and bring it to the blood. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't dwell there, but let's face it. We all get that sometimes. Let no man deceive you with vain words, verse 6. For because of these things comes the what? The wrath of God on the children of disobedience. Man, folks don't like to talk about the wrath of God no more, but it's there. I thank God that his wrath was placed on Christ for me. That Jesus took the wrath that was meant for me, was placed on Jesus. Verse 7. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. <laughs> oh, God help us. Them old timers never used to watch TV. I'm not sure, so sure they had a, such a bad idea. Because you can't watch nothing on TV without getting that stuff flashed in your face somewhere, even on the commercials. For ye were sometimes, now listen, verse 8, here we go. I'm closing, I'm honest. For you were sometimes darkness. You remember when you were darkness? I remember when I was darkness. I didn't think I was darkness. I thought I was pretty cool. I thought I was all right. I thought I had it all together. Nope, not too many other people thought that, but I did. But I was darkness. For you were sometimes darkness, but now, saints, are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. Is there a way we ought to live as believers? Is it important what the world sees believers doing? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Oh, I could read on a little bit more and we'll just... And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of the Lord help us. Lord help us. I think of things, and in, in I, I, I was talking with somebody this week, and we were talking about, you know, going back. And I can remember, and I've said this before, some of you have heard me say this before, I can remember before I was saved, there were certain, certain kinds of music I used to like to listen to, that when I would listen, and it wasn't necessarily bad music in itself, it was just kind of non-anything. And I would listen to the music back then, and I would sit there, and I would get high without smoking anything. I mean, it was just good, I was just like, man, get in this music. So, well, so anyway, I got saved, and I got away from that. Every once in a while, I'm floating around the internet. And I'll see, you know, YouTube. And there's somebody I used to listen to. So, oh, man. And I'll click on that. And that music will start playing. And I'll start. <laughs> and God says, I took you out of that. I said, what? It's, it's nothing evil. It's not saying anything evil. It's not demonic. It's just, but God says, I took you out of that. How many of us, if you examine yourself, See, don't, I'm not going to examine you, you examine yourself. What has God taken you out of that you find yourself drawn back to? And you get back there and you go, hmm. It's very, listen, the devil is very subtle. He's very subtle. He just says, oh, it's, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with that. See, your thing might be different than mine. I'm not, I'm just telling you my, my thing. He says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, in verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which were done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. 
Wherefore he says, awake. See, when the light comes, and I've, I've told this to people before, I, I used to think that the, the longer I go as a believer, it gets easier. The, you know, well, I'm saved 30 years, man. This thing's going to start getting, e this thing's gonna get, start getting easier one of these days. I'm going to start, it's going to start getting easier. It's going it's to start getting easier. God, it's not easier. You know why? Because the closer you get to the light, the more you see. Come on, you all know when you look in the mirror and you look and the light's real bright, you say, oh, you turn the light down a little bit? <laughs> you know, that's why sin works best in the night. <laughs> okay? But the light, and the closer you get to God, the more he shows you. And the deeper it goes, the deeper that the scalpel goes. When the word separates the bone from the marrow, the closer, the more the word you get in you, the more God shows you the things about you that he would like to see change. This is to believers. If you're not a believer, this doesn't count. This is to believers. He says, wherefore, he says, awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, like a soldier on a battlefield, looking for, looking for mines and booby traps. See, we need, to be, we need to be woke up as believers. We need to realize that all that stuff out there that seems kind of innocuous, listen, if it's not about Christ, it'll tend to draw you away. Some people say, well, you can get too religious. Well, yeah, you can get too religious, but I sure can't get too saved. I sure can't get too righteous. I can't get too holy. I can't get too delivered. You ever, ever talk to somebody that's like, you know, battling with an addiction and say, well, I don't want to get too delivered. Huh. You see, we're living in a time when God's, it's like, it's like the line is drawn. Been a gray area for a long time where you could kind of like muddle in the middle, kind of be over here for a while and over there for a while, but the, the line is drawn. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I want to be a light in darkness. How about you? Listen, I don't want anybody to get condemned or, or get a big guilt trip. But listen, allow God to show you those things. This, this putting, Jesus talked about putting a bushel over the candle. Man, we're good at putting bushels over the candle. We're good. We're good at, you know, and I've, I've been there. I've, I've been good at being, shining my light one day, and the next day just put the lampshade on. He wants our lights to shine. He wants your lights to shine. Because we're living in a dark and perverted world. And he wants our lights to shine. I want to pray this morning for every one of you. Where you, you know this is between you and God. You know, you know those areas. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't want to know anybody's business. Unless you want to tell me, and we'll counsel and we'll do that. I mean, I, that's part of my, what I do. If you want to talk, we'll pray, and we'll get together and pray. and Pray you through. We can pray you through. Because there are folks who have been prayed. I've been prayed through a couple times. Jesus is a name above every name. He's a name above that thing that's keeping you from being everything you can be for Jesus. He's, he has the ability to set you free from what it is that's keeping you from being everything God wants you to be. I'm going to pray this morning, and we're going to dismiss. And again, if you want to come up for prayer, we could pray. Or maybe you want to come up for prayer right now. You know, sometimes we don't. If there's stuff in your life that you know is keeping you from being the light that God wants you to be, can you just come up here and stand? I'm not going to pray for individuals. Just come up here and stand.